Okay, welcome everybody to the the session um, for the ISIS 2021 uh, conference uh, on differential privacy and public data products in the United States. Um, I'm Rhonda Cowan. I am. I will be your moderator uh, or guide through or Sherpa through this really exciting panel that we put together. Um, just a reminder: uh, we are recording, and captioning should be available if you if you uh, if you want to uh, use uh, that service. Um, we will have questions at the end of the three presentations, so please uh, submit any questions to the Zoom Q and A, uh, and then we will address them as many as possible during the session, and then hopefully be able to answer them on the Whova after. Uh, so, without further ado, to get this panel going, um, I was we were talking before that this panel actually was submitted uh, one and a half years ago for ISS 2020. And if people can remember that far ago, I, it's hard for me to even remember what happened a week ago, but anything before the pandemic is kind of a blur in my mind. But back then, differential privacy, uh, as proposed by this US Census Bureau was a really super hot uh, topic. And there was a lot of discussion and excitement about that. I feel that it's still ver a very hot topic, although a lot of other things like a pandemic has pushed things like this out of people's attention span. And I feel like uh, there's gonna be a lot of implications that you will hear about from our three speakers. So we basically have this very excellent panel and a very tiny panel. Let's walk through all, through the, the intricacies of differential privacy and we'll address, sort of give people a sense of um, how it works. It's, and the implications for our data users to the impact on census 2020 data products. Um, and so without further ado, let me uh, stop sharing and turn it over and introduce our first speaker, Tracy Kugler. Tracy is a research scientist with the IPOMS Data Center at the University of Minnesota. She works primarily with subnational tabulations of census data, both US and international. Tracy has been involved in IPUM's efforts to understand the Census Bureau's impl implementation of differential privacy and communicate the mechanics, implications, and data resources to census data users. Tracy will cover the US Census Bureau's implementation of differential price privacy. Tracy. Okay, let's try this again, now that I've found my unmute button. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, so as Ron said, I'm gonna give an overview of the US Census Bureau's implementation of differential privacy. So I'll briefly describe why the Census Bureau is using differential privacy, what differential privacy is and is not, and some of the specifics of the Bureau's implementation of it. So for since the 2020 or 2010 census, the Census Bureau has become increasingly concerned about disclosure risks, uh, citing increased computing power and proliferation of external data sources like credit bureau sources, uh, administrative data and so forth. So they are afraid that it is now more possible for attackers to identify individuals from the census data that are published. And in 2017, they conducted a simulated re-identification attack and found that they were able to correctly match all characteristics for 17% of individuals in the 2010 census. 
and they found that quite alarming and concluded that previous disclosure avoidance methods, so traditional methods like swapping and suppression uh, were no longer adequate and that they were going to implement differential privacy for the 2020 census. So what is differential privacy? It is a collection of methods of introducing noise into data products that are published such that there's a mathematical guarantee that the risk to any individual of disclosure of their characteristics is no greater than a certain threshold if they participate in the data collection method, the census, over if they had not participated at all. So it's a kind of uh, mathematical guarantee over how much privacy is available in that collection effort. Differential privacy is not a specific algorithm for disclosure control. So there are a wide variety of ways of implementing differential privacy. And it's also not an absolute guarantee against disclosure risk for any particular individual. So a little bit about the basics, basic mechanics of differential privacy in general. So I'll just walk through a little toy example of how one might implement differential privacy in a very small survey. So let's say we surveyed 100 people and we asked them two questions, their sex and whether or not they were currently attending school. And we got these responses. So there are 100 individuals represented here. We have three males who never attended school, 12 males who are currently attending school and so forth. We can take that microdata and tabulate it into a cross tabulation that has six cells, two rows, one for each sex and three columns, one for each category of school attendance. So here are our three males who never attended school, our 12 males who are currently attending school and so forth. And of course the values in this cross tabulation add up to our population of 100. We then introduce noise into that cross tabulation. The noise is drawn from a statistical distribution that is centered at zero and falls off to tails at higher values. And we draw a noise value for each cell in the cross tab. Uh, the distribution of this or the spread of this distribution is determined by a parameter called epsilon that is the global privacy loss budget. And the larger epsilon is, the narrower this distribution is. So the smaller the noise values are going to be. Uh, in this case, we have six cells in our cross tabulation. So we draw six noise values and most of those will be small. You might get some larger noise values. We then take those six noise values and randomly distribute them across the cells in our cross tabulation. And it's important to note that the noise that is introduced is independent of the original value of the cell. So you might get a relatively small cell that gets a fairly large noise value introduced. In this example, we had four females who had never attended school and we ended up adding that plus eight noise value to that cell. So we, it now looks as though we had 12 females who had never attended school. You'll also note that the sum of the noisy values in this table is now 108, which is more than our original counted population of 100. We could introduce post-processing and a constraint to hold that total population constant and the Bureau has chosen to implement some uh, invariance to keep certain things constant. We can then take that cross tab uh, because it included all of the variables in our original survey. It fully specifies synthetic microdata. So we can create synthetic microdata records for one male never attending school, a second male never attending school, that is the noisy value of two for that cell. And if we had more variables in our survey uh, that we didn't construct cross tabulations for as part of the noise in infusion, 
we could tabulate those from the synthetic microdata. All right, the Census Bureau has a bit of a more complicated problem than two questions for a population of 100 people. And in particular, uh, they have to keep track of geography. So they have to keep track of where people were uh, as kind of a meta question on the census. There aren't that many questions on the decennial census, but some of them do have many possible responses. So in order to track the geographic aspects of the final data production, the Census Bureau has developed what they call a top-down algorithm. And that works down the geographic hierarchy, uh, starting from the national level data and moving to lower geographic levels in sequence. Uh, and that this algorithm is allows the lower geographic levels to kind of borrow accuracy from the higher levels. Um, so you get a slightly better data product. At the national level, so where we start is with the clean enumerated data. So the, this is effectively the true data. The Bureau calculates any invariance and constraints from that clean data. Uh, so for example, the Bureau is holding state level total population as an invariant. That means it won't change from what was enumerated. So they would calculate each state's total population from this cleaned data and hold that as an invariant. They then calculate the cross tabulations in what are called queries. And queries are not necessarily the tables that will ultimately be published. They are cross tabulations that are designed to preserve certain relationships among the variables in the census uh, that are deemed important to maintain as close to true as possible. So another important thing to note is that a variable can appear in multiple queries. You might have an age by sex query and an age by race query. And those are two independent cross tabulations. Noise is then infused into each of those queries independently so that age by sex table and the age by race table each get independent noise values. That makes all of those noisy queries inconsistent with each other. So your age totals from the age by sex query won't match those of the age by race query, which means we have an optimization problem. Those noisy queries are fed into the optimization problem as well as the invariance and constraints. And this optimization problem attempts to get kind of in the middle of all of these noisy queries while maintaining the invariance. The output of that optimization is the national level detail table. And the detail table is the full cross tab of all the variables. It effectively fully specifies the synthetic microdata. We then move down to a lower level of geography and do a similar process. So here where the next level is states, we take the clean enumerated data, we calculate state level queries so the same set of queries that we calculated at the national level, and we infuse noise into those. And those go into an optimization problem at this stage. The difference with this problem is that now that differentially private national level detail table acts as a constraint in that optimization problem. So you can kind of think of this as taking all of those synthetic microdata records that you had specified by this national level detail table and assigning state identifiers to those in order to match these noisy state level queries as closely as possible. That then becomes the differentially private state level detail table, which then serves as constraints for the next geographic level down and so forth until we get all the way down to blocks. So that's the basics of how the Bureau is implementing differential privacy. Within this algorithm, there are a whole lot of policy decisions that need to be made. And so I'm gonna talk about some of those and particularly decisions that have changed recently. These policy decisions affect the output um, of the, what you get as published census data and it's important to recognize that these are decisions that are made by people. 
they're not things that you can put into an algorithm and get back the optimal answer to because there are trade-offs across what you, where you want your accuracy, how much, where you want to sit on the trade-off between accuracy and privacy and so forth. So there's a lot of different pieces that play into this and there's complex interactions among all those factors. So you can't necessarily tell when you pull on one lever exactly what's gonna come out at the other end because it plays in with all of these other decisions that you have to make. So the Bureau for the last nine to 12 months has been doing essentially a series of experiments where they vary all of these different decisions and look at the output and try to determine what is the best combination of decisions. Of course, what is defined as best is in the eye of the beholder. So the first one I wanna mention is that for the most recent demonstration data product, product that was released in April, the Bureau set an accuracy target. Uh, this is for just the redistricting data. So voting age and non-voting age population by race. Uh, and that is tuned for Voting Rights Act use cases. The scope of this target is geographic units that have populations over 500 people. And the metric that they decided to use was the proportion of the largest racial group. Their target was to get that proportion within five percentage points of the enumerated value for 95% of the geographic units with population greater than 500 people. And the report that they actually, in this most recent demonstration data product got that target within that five percentage point target for 90, about 99% of the geographic units. I mentioned, as I was describing the algorithm, there are a series of invariants and constraints that play into those optimization problems. In the 2020 decennial census, the invariance will be total population at the state level, total housing units at the block level, and the number and type of group quarters facilities at the block level. And these invariants and constraints have been the same for all of the demonstration data products that the Bureau has produced. There are some key differences from the invariants that we had in 2010. In 2010, total population was held invariant all the way down to the block level. And we also had invariants on occupancy status and voting age population all the way down to the block level. And those are no longer the case. Uh, so noise will be introduced into these counts for the 2020 census. On the constraint side, these are kind of the global technical constraints. So non-negativity, you can't have negative counts of people. Uh, there are a series of structural zeros that are specified. So for example, you can't have uh, people under a certain age that are in group quarters facilities designated for seniors. Uh, and you also have consistency that is enforced across geographic levels. So the population of every county in the state will add up to the total population for the state. And that holds at all geographic levels and between tables. So the, if you sum up all of the people under age five in one table, that will be the same count as the people under age five in another table. One of the biggest decisions that the Bureau has been wrestling with is where to set the global privacy loss budget. So this is that parameter epsilon that controls the spread of the distribution from which we're drawing noise. Higher epsilon values narrow that distribution. You get smaller noise values, which means you have better accuracy, but you also have less privacy protection. Conversely, for lower values of epsilon, you get larger noise values, which means less accuracy and more privacy protection. For the previous demonstration data products, epsilon has been about four. For the most recent demonstration data product, epsilon has been set at about 12. And the Bureau reports that this value of 12 is more consistent with what they will ultimately use for the published data. There's also a question of exactly which distribution you use for the noise. Uh, traditional dis 
Uh, differential privacy uses a Laplace distribution, which has a narrow peak. So most, most noise values are very small, but it also has rather thick tails, which means that you can get some not insignificant number of very large noise values, which causes some things to look really weird in the final data. For the most recent two demonstration data products, the Bureau has switched to using a Gaussian distribution, which has a somewhat wider peak, which means you get more noise values in kind of a middle range. They're still mostly small, uh, but you also have thin tails. So you get very few, very large noise values. The other big change that the Bureau has made recently is with respect to the geographic hierarchy. So the earlier versions of the demonstration data use the kind of standard Census Bureau nesting hierarchy where you have nation, state, county, census tract, block group, and census blocks. And those were what went into that top-down algorithm. The problem is that units off of what's called the spine are built up then from census blocks usually and they are less accurate than units that are along the spine. And there are some important types of units off the spine, particularly places, county subdivisions, and AIAN areas where there are legal requirements. And these are legal entities that are trying to make funding decisions and so forth. So they need data to be as accurate as possible. What the Bureau has done in their most recent demonstration data product is to create an alternate hierarchy where you still have nation, state, and county. Um, but then instead of the tabulation block groups, they've created these what they call optimized block groups, which is a terrible name. It's very confusing. Um, but what those are are intersections of counties, census tracts, AIAN areas grouped by state. And then depending on which state you're in, places or county subdivision. Those are intersected to create optimized block groups. And then those are used on the, in the top-down algorithm in the place of traditional block groups. Uh, the optimized block groups are just used in that algorithm. The tabulations that are published will be for the regular nesting block groups uh, that we know and love. Um, but this, by putting county subdivisions, places, and AIN areas in this optimized block group concept, we get better accuracy for the populations in those areas. And you'll see some of that uh, in Dave's presentation. Uh, you, it is worth noting that the block groups are now off of the spine. So the block group populations and tabulations are less accurate than they had been in previous iterations. And finally, uh, the algorithm depends on the set of queries that you define and use for your noise injection. Again, these aren't the published tables. These are just the relationships that you're kind of preserving as best as possible through the algorithm. So this is the set of queries that is being used. And in the most recent iteration, um, each query gets a allocation of the privacy loss budget. Those define the width of dis the distribution that is used for that particular cross tabs noise. In the most recent uh, demonstration data product, the allocations are based on the number of cells, roughly based on the number of cells in the cross tabulation. So tabulations with more cells get use narrower distributions for the noise, which means that you're less likely as you're drawing 252 different noise values, you're less likely to get large uh, noise values introduced into this cross tabulation, which has a lot of small cells. And that's all that I have. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Dave who will show what we're getting out at the end of all of this. Thanks, Tracy. That, that really gave everybody a good foundation. I 
did a really great job at explaining a very complicated process. Um, so our next uh, speaker uh, is Dave Van Riper. Uh, Dave is the Director of Spatial Analysis at the IPUMS Data Center at the University of Minnesota. He is co-principal investigator of the IPUMS NHDIS product, which disseminates small area census data for the US from 1790 to the present. He has led IPUMS effort to understand the Census Bureau's differentially private algorithm and examine its potential impacts on the accuracy of the Senio data. Dave will talk about the implications of differential privacy for data users. Take it away, Dave. Great, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Tracy, for that great setup. Um, hi, everyone, I'm Dave Van Riper from IPAMS. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the implications for data users and show you what the various algorithms that the Census Bureau has used to produce these demonstration data products, how, how do that, what's the quality of these data look like? Uh, I come at this from someone who tends to be a data user. So I want to get like my, my preference is more accurate data and I want accurate data for, you know, small areas or subpopulations. And, and today I'm gonna show you uh, what some of the um, results have been looking at the ver various products that have been published. So as Tracy mentioned, uh, the Census Bureau has actually published a number of uh, demonstration data products since uh, starting in October of 2019. In today's presentation, I'm going to be using six different data products. My gold standard or my, my reference data set is the 2010 Summary File 1 uh, product that was published following the 2010 decennial census. And we have five different demonstration data products that have come out. Um, we have a, the, the initial product was published in October of 2019, uh, the second in June of 2020. The third vintage I'll talk about was for, uh, that will be mentioned is the one from November of 2020. And then at the end of April, the Bureau published two different uh, demonstration data products, what I'm calling vintage four and five. Uh, those uh, use the exact same algorithm for producing the, the, the demonstration data, but they use a different global privacy loss budget that Tracy mentioned previously. Uh, vintage, one of them uses a, a privacy loss budget of uh, 12, and one of them uses a privacy loss budget of 4.5. So that, that comparison lets us see um, uh, how changing the privacy loss budget impacts the quality or accuracy of the output data. So just to recap a little bit, uh, some of the things Tracy mentioned. So the differences between these vintages or these demonstration products, uh, the global privacy loss budget for vintages one to four was 4.5 and the uh, uh, vintage five has a privacy loss budget of 12. So much higher. Uh, the geographic hierarchy differs quite a bit uh, among these products. So for vintages one and two, they use the traditional uh, central hierarchy of the, of the Census Bureau's um, uh, uh, traditional diagram. So nation, state, county, census, tract, block, group, and block. For vintages three and four, they introduced a new kind of uh, tweak to that hierarchy. They did some unique handling for American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian lands. Uh, within states. So they, they implemented a special handling for those to try to make them to help improve the accuracy of those data. And the geographic hierarchy is the same for vintages four and five. And this is what Tracy just talked about. This is that optimized geographic spine trying to improve the accuracy for cities and towns and uh, American Indian and Alaska Native areas. Um, the queries that Tracy talked about, had we've seen substantial variation in queries by vintage. Uh, I don't think they've ever used the exact same set of queries. They've been doing a, a lot of testing, um, and looking at a wide variety of query strategies to see what strategy um, does the most to improve accuracy. So as Tracy mentioned, in this most recent product, they allocated a privacy loss budget in um, proportion to the number of cells in a query. In prior demonstration data products, they simply allocated a fixed fraction to all queries or they, they set a fraction to queries and, and use that. They didn't do a dynamic allocation. So they've been doing a lot of testing to that to kind of see what, what makes things improve or get worse when, with, 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 you know, with respect to accuracy. So in, um, in today's, uh, in the next kind of five slides, we're gonna be comparing the, the, the demonstration data products with the um, summary file one data. Now. Um, summary file one serves as our ground truth. 
And for the total population slides that I'm going to show you where I compare the total population from the demonstration product with total population from summary file one, in those cases, we're looking at actual error because the total population counts from summary file one were, were held in variance. So there was no noise injected into those. Um, so that, that's real error. When we look at the, the um, Hispanic population and the um, uh, black alone population and the population pyramid, the age by sex pyramids, um, uh, those were subject to prior disclosure avoidance techniques. Um, and the Census Bureau used swapping. They swapped households who they deemed were at risk for re-identification. And so uh, you would see some, um, there is noise injected into some of those, kind of noise infused into those kinds, but it's not like, not the noise injection that Tracy showed. You're just swapping a few people. The number of people is held constant, but the number of people with a certain set of characteristics may, may differ. Um, and the other thing to notice is I can't do, I can't, do everything for all vintages. Vintages three through five, so November and the two Aprils, only provide data on race, ethnicity, and voting age, voting age and group quarters uh, um, status. We don't have age, we don't have sex, we don't have other household information in those in those products. So we're really restricted at the types of um, types of attributes and the types of counts we can we can look at. So let's see what the the results look like. So you're going to see a set of three kind of bar charts here and let me orient you. So this, this is a bar chart for, for total population. And each of these panels is for a different geographic uh, level. So we have census tracts in the upper, um, upper left, uh, places in the lower left, block groups in the upper right, and the American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian lands in the lower uh, right corner. Uh, what I've done is I've taken each of these sets of geographies and I've broken them up into their deciles based on their 2010 summary file one total population count. So decile one is the smallest population decile and decile 10 is the largest population decile. For reference, I've put the mean population for a decile here in the, um, in the right. So the uh, population decile one for census tracts is a mean of 1400 people, but population decile one for places has a mean of only 74 people. It's quite small. And you can see for places, we have a, a range of 74 up to 59,000. So we have a, a wide range of, of, of place sizes in, in the US. Um, and then the, the bars, the width of the bars, what I did is I looked at the number of units that had a discrepancy that was greater than 5%. So I subtracted, I took the absolute value of the difference between the summary file one and demonstration product. And I divided by the average of the, the by the sub, by the average of the summary file one and demonstration product to get a to get a fraction. And I counted the number of those that were above five percent. And I divided that by the number of units in the decile to figure out what fraction of that decile has a discrepancy greater than than five percent. So the, the if we look here at the, at the tracked version, we see that in the original 2019 demonstration product except at the very low end, the very smallest population deciles, we saw about 10% of those units, uh, about 700, uh, had a discrepancy greater than 5%. Uh, as we move across the demonstration products in May and in November, um, that, uh, that almost no census tracts have a discrepancy uh, of 5% uh, between the two, between the products. Um, then we see in, in the April products, we see a, a little bit of a change here. So all of a sudden in April, we have a, a larger fraction of tracts in the smaller population deciles have that discrepancy of 5%. Um, so, and, and this is for the Epsilon 4 uh, demonstration product. So this is comparable with November, May, and October. What we think is driving this is this new optimized geographic, this new optimized block group is making the data quality for small tracks a little bit less, a little bit less accurate. Uh, and then for the epsilon of 12, we again see almost 10% of tracks have a 5% uh, discrepancy here at the low end. Um, if we look at block groups, we see where that optimized spine really plays, plays, a, plays a role. If we look here at the April 2021 epsilon of four product, we can see that a, a large fraction, an increasingly large fraction, almost up to 
30% in the smallest population decile have discrepancies greater than 5%. You'll notice in November and May, our, our, our error bars, our bars never got that wide. Uh, what's happening here is that that new optimized um, uh, block group is really making the tabulation block groups less accurate. Uh, but if you look at the place data, we see what the trade-off is there. So if we look at places, the place data in the April products is, is much more accurate. We have many fewer places that have a discrepancy greater than 5% compared to the November, May, and October data set. So they're, they're making the place data more accurate, but it's coming at the expense of some other, other entities, in, namely block groups. And finally, for Alaska Indian and Alaska, American Indian Alaska Native lands, uh, we see an improvement in the, in the accuracy, uh, especially for the epsilon of 12 value here. But we see relatively small differences between the April 2021 and November 2020 products, showing that the new optimized spine may be giving us slight improvements. But here, the big improvement comes from the, epsilon, the increasing epsilon from 4 to 12. So that's for total population. If we subdivide the population more into, into specific categories, so in this case, we're looking at the Hispanic population, you'll notice that those bars just get, just get bigger. So all of a sudden we've got, you know, we've got uh, uh, decile one here for April 2021, 20, epsilon of 12, 75% of all block groups um, have a, percent uh, discrepancy, a percent of discrepancy greater than 5%, almost all of them do. It's a very large fraction. And what's happening here is that the Hispanic counts in num at many of these block groups is quite small, where right? we may have a Hispanic count of 20 or 25, and the discrepancy of 5% is, 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 uh, is relatively small. You don't need to infuse much noise into those to get that, to get that, um, to get that uh, Five percent difference uh, in the in the uh, in the output, uh, but you can see here that if you're if you're measuring Hispanics and you're looking at like the fraction of Hispanics in, in a given place, um, the differentially private data uh, may really be it may may be giving you a kind of less accurate data, and we're not seeing a major change by algorithm or by uh, uh, by epsilon for this particular subpopulation for pretty much any of the of the geographic levels, right? We don't really see uh, a large fraction of the error of those bars getting narrower for a particular geographic level. This is the black alone population. The story here is fairly similar. Um, we see uh, the census tract uh, uh, error uh, bars here are a little bit narrower for the epsilon of 12 uh, uh, data set. But for a number of the other ones, we may see a slight improvement for uh, the Epsilon 12 products in, in all cases, but the shapes of these are very similar. We're still seeing you know, a decent number of entities with a, uh, with a discrepancy of, of greater than 5% between this SF1 and any of these demonstration data, uh, data products. So we're seeing improvements. Uh, you know, the place count seem to be getting better, especially for total population. Um, we're seeing some improvements for, for uh, American Indian lands, but we're seeing that trade-off is in the accuracy for the, um, for the uh, uh, block groups in, in particular. Now let's just take a quick dive into some uh, population pyramids. Here we can only look at data from May 2020, June 2020, and October 2019. This is just five-year uh, age bins, and each uh, each uh, row is, a, is an age bin, and then the uh, male counts are to the left and the female counts are to the right for each five-year age bin. And the red are the SF1 population pyramids, the blue are the May 2020 population pyramids, and the green are the October 29, 2019 population pyramids. Here we can see that for large um, subcategories, this is for Hennepin County, for the white alone counts, the black alone counts, we tend to see pretty good uh, uh, concordance between the three products. Uh, when we get down to the American Indian alone, uh, we see more, more noise, more jagged uh, output in the, the blue and uh, uh, green lines compared to the relatively smooth, smooth red line here. The Anhopi population is so small in Hennepin County that even the SF1 counts are kind of jagged, uh, and we see you know, very large discrepancies, particularly in the October 2019 uh, uh, data set. And we'd really like to see all of these um, lines kind of converge on the, on the red. 
Uh, and this is Lyon County, Minnesota. This is the median county in the US in 2010. Here you can see as we as we get down to some of these small subpopulations that have only you know 40 to 80 people in them, the noise injection really provides us with um, pretty pretty inaccurate data. Now it might be protecting the privacy of those people, but you don't really have a good sense of what's going on in the in the black alone by sex by age uh, counts for this particular county. So if you're interested, we've got a few resources. We've put together uh, tabulations from these products and they're available at these, these websites. Uh, you can download them and we've created files that have tabulations of the demonstration products linked up with the, uh, same, ta the same tabulation from SF1 to make it easy for you to compare the outputs and try to look and see what impact the, the uh, top-down algorithm might be having on the quality of the data. Uh, thank you. Great. That was really diving, helping us dive a little bit into the weeds there, Dave, on some of the uh, challenges and things to look out for uh, when you start looking at this data as it's released. Uh, our third and final speaker for this panel is Jan Vink. Uh, Jan uh, is a researcher at the Cornell University Program on Applied Demographics. Jan represents New York State and a variety of cooperatives with the U.S. Census Bureau and was involved in many of the operations that come with the decennial census. His research interests include population estimates and projections for, for which having access to high quality census data is very important. Jan will discuss the Census 2020 public data products, which is something I think we're all going to be interested in hearing more about. So take it away, Jan. Uh, you're you're muted. Oh, Jan, are you there? Thanks. Sorry, <laughs> little trouble finding the unmute button. Uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Ron, and thank you all for attending this uh, this session. Uh, as Ron mentioned earlier, we set this panel up about a year and a half ago, and uh, I titled it now "What We Know and Don't Know." I think I could have held almost the exact same presentation a year and a, or a year ago. But since that time, there's not a lot more information coming out of the Census Bureau about the data products. So there is still a lot of unknowns. Uh, when we start with a uh, with a overview of the of the data products and I split them in two groups on the left data products that are based on the on the census counts and I will go through them one by one uh, following but there are also some data products that are more about the counts and that will give some insights in, in the census quality and the coverage of the census and how the whole process went the data products started a few weeks ago with the release of the apportionment data. The apportionment data is used to determine the number of representatives in the US House for the coming decade, and also the number of votes in the Electoral College. It consists out of two numbers for each state, the resident count and the count of overseas population that is assigned to each state. Because of COVID, the whole, all the operations were uh, were delayed, and uh, not sure who, but the decision was made that the quality of the counts took uh, precedence over the, the the timing. The law says that these data should have been released before the end of December, but the Census Bureau at least felt that they were not ready. To, to produce quality data at that, uh, that point in time. So the data was released on, uh, on April 26th. The redistricting data, also called PL94, and was mentioned before, uh, is the next data product. Should have been released before the end of April, but yeah, because of COVID and, and all, all the quality controls, uh, will not be, be released for, for another couple of months. The data has uh, information counts at, at the block, since block level, 
on the total population and population by race, Hispanic origin, and the, and the voting age. And it also contains some information about housing unit count, and occupancy, and uh, group quarters count. It, it will be released in, in kind of in two flavors. First, uh, a, in a very raw format uh, by August 16, and in a more polished format by, by September, 20, uh, September 30th. Why they do it is because states are pressing on the Census Bureau to, to release this data. Every state has its own timeline before they have to have uh, new legislative districts ready. So the longer the Census Bureau waits with the publication of this data, the longer uh, or the shorter the time window the states have to draw new maps. This data will also be the first release that a differential privacy method is uh, used as a disclosure avoidance. And for me, a big unknown is how the general public will react to, uh, to doing this. They probably don't know much about the differential privacy, but when they look at their own tabulation of their own block, just because they are interested in the census and what, what did the census do with their responses, all of a sudden they see only persons under 18 in their block. Or they didn't tabulate any occupied houses where the respondent knows that they filled out the census form and how could my house be, be vacant? So those kinds of questions might come up uh, after this release. And I'm not sure that the Census Bureau is ready with a, with a reaction. After the, the redistricting file is done, it, it is time to, to start thinking about uh, more detailed age and, and also the housing and household characteristics. This is a kind of an in-between product between the redistricting file and the, uh, the full full detail that's called the demographic profile. It's a, it's a brief overview with, with the essential statistics for, for a, a lot of governmental uh, entities. There is a proposed table shell and the profile will look like it did in 2010. Uh, there's still some questions about the timing. The, the, the intent is to publish it soon after the redistricting file, but I'm not sure how, is the, how that is gonna work. And uh, there's also still a little bit of an open question. The intent is to have all the products consistent with each other, but uh, I, in presentations, I get a feeling that the door is a little bit ajar that, that uh, allowing for inconsistencies to improve individual accuracy in, in follow-up products. We'll, we'll see. So then, uh, yeah, at, at one point in time, the Census Bureau will release the demographic and housing characteristics file, or, or DHC. This, this is the product for, for the most, most of the data users. It, it contains a lot of detail on, on age and cross tabulations of age by race and uh, yeah, uh, household composition, all, all, all the good stuff. Uh, again, there is a proposed set of table shells that was released about a year and a half ago. We're asking for feedback. And Census Bureau is very tight lipped on what they did with that feedback. And even now, you hear rumors that they still want, want to make changes. Uh, the geographic detail of every table is not, not completely clear. The timing, as I said, you know, talked a little bit out, uh, about the consistency. Uh, but the Census, Census Bureau wants to do, as David Tracy also pointed out, uh, there were demonstration products in preparation for the PL file. Similarly, the Census Bureau wants to involve stakeholders in the production of, uh, of the DHC and give, do the fine tuning in, uh, yeah, with, with data users involved. 
a little bit more about the DHC and, and uh, the different types of tables. There are tables that with the blocks as the lowest level of geography, census tract and counties. So the more geographic detail, the less data detail in the table. So there's a bit of a trade-off and that's important to keep in mind. The Census Bureau is planning to reduce the number of tables. A lot of tables are planned to be eliminated and other tables that were published on the, on the block level now shift to track or county level as the lowest level of geography. By this reduction in tables, each table is based on, on those queries Tracy mentioned. And so, and each, each query uses a piece of the, the privacy budget. So if you decide not to publish a certain table, then you don't have to spend privacy budget to, to you don't have to create that query and you don't have to spend privacy budget. But what does that mean? Now, race detail was already in the in the PL file. And yeah, uh, I might have to use the PL file more than you had to do in, in 2010. For age, some of the age, age tabulations will move to a, to a larger level of geography. And uh, the single year of age uh, by, by race categories is, uh, is eliminated in the proposal. And that, that will be a make, big miss, uh, I'm afraid. Households and families, a lot of tables will be eliminated, especially for, for families. Information about ho household and type of, of household and, and, and size of household, those kind of things, uh, move from the block level to the county level. Uh, also of note is, is that uh, for the household, there will be some tables that add a detail on the same sex couples. And that will be the first time uh, that information on same sex couples comes directly out of uh, out of the census or is published directly with the census counts. Group quarters move up in uh, in geography, but uh, but much more data available on the block and the track level in 2010, and it's now moving to county and state level. And one table that is being eliminated is household size by tenure. Uh, yeah, it's also a table that will be missed um, because renter occupied housing has different household sizes than owner occupied. Uh, thinking about this, uh, I think areas within counties, crossing countries like, like the minor civil efficient places, school districts, they, they are mostly impacted and tracked based on um, the neighborhoods as well. It gets, many fewer statistics, especially on household types and, and the household population. After the demographic and housing characteristics, there, there is a, a detailed demographic and housing characteristics product planned uh, with statistics on detailed race and ethnicity groups, and also with uh, information about with complex person household joint tables. I assume that that will be things like family uh, families. We don't know anything about the timing. We don't know anything about the geography. And as far as the disclosure avoidance system, we only know it's not being done by the top-down algorithm, but a new different algorithm will be used to produce uh, this table. Last table, last product I want to talk about is a public use microdata sample. It was released in 2010. It's currently not in the plans. There is a lot of experience with, with the, the, the PPMF, the privacy protected microdata files, and it kind of looks very similar. So, and theoretically, they can release the full P, PPMF. Uh, no, no worries about the privacy, but all those fields are not optimized for, for use at a record level. Record level. So the, uh, the correlations 
uh, are will be all mixed up and, and the product will be kind of kind of useless. A couple of links to, to the resources. That ends my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. Um, let's uh, bring the all the panelists back for uh, some uh, questions from our our attendees. Um, First, before we start the questions, just want to thank uh, our three panelists, uh, Tracy Kugler, um, Dave Van Ripper, Riper, sorry, Dave Van Riper, right. and Jan Vink, and also uh, Catherine Fitch, who was instrumental also in organizing this panel uh, for their contributions. And I'm sure everybody will remember and note their names and contact information, because this is going to be an issue that we're going to be grappling with for at least the next year or two as census products start being released and researchers start using the data. So um, the first question is from Robin Rice and it's for Tracy. Um, you really both know and explained this so well. Do you have a personal opinion about the changes made to the data, for example, privacy versus accuracy trade-off? Well, that's quite the question to start with. <laughs> uh, yes, I have opinions. I think we all have opinions. Um, I think that the changes that the Bureau has been making over the last year and a half have improved the quality of the data. Um, it's certainly, as you saw in Dave's presentation, the accuracy has been getting better. Um, but I don't think that we are really at a point of having truly useful data uh, if they were to run the algorithm with exactly the parameters they use for the most recent product. Um, there's so many trade-offs in terms of what you are balancing and what you're giving priority to. And we saw that like with the accuracy target that they had for the recent data product, it's very focused on specific PL94 data use cases. And that kind of comes at the expense of other things. So you see that the total populations are kind of okay in most places. And in particular, uh, there was kind of an outcry about the poor accuracy for places, and that's been improved. Um, but it all comes at the expense of other things. So like you saw in Dave's presentation, counts for particular populations with particular characteristics are still kind of all over the place. And the Bureau continues to claim that the noise introduced by differential privacy is no more than the error introduced by uh, sampling issues or undercounts or missing households or whatever. Uh, I don't buy that at all. And as you saw, particularly with the population pyramids from 2010, uh, with the traditional disclosure techniques, those population pyramids looked reasonable. They were smooth, they had higher counts in places where you would expect the counts to be higher. They kind of made sense. And you saw in the differentially private data, um, the population pyramids were, were kind of all over the place. So there's, there, unpredictable errors and you just don't quite know what you're getting. So I think that uh, we still haven't come to a place where this data is particularly trustworthy for a lot of purposes. Great. Uh, Jan, Dave, do you have anything to add to that as far as maybe your personal opinions about the, what's going on right now? <laughs> If not, that's fine. We have a, another question, yeah. but uh, I, I agree um, with what Tracy said. That uh, yes, yeah. and I see Lisa had asked a question that Dave answered, and I, I invite the other panelists to add the thoughts. I think I'll. Um, we want to be able to. Now we just got a whole slew of questions, so uh, <laughs> and we only have one minute left. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our uh, panelists to answer those. Uh, when they can uh, uh, in the Q and A uh, in Whova, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask the question that I I have for this. Uh, you know, many of us are data librarians, 
And we've yet to see the actual impact of this. In some ways, it reminds me of when the Census Bureau changed the racial categories in 2000. And it had a lot of implications for researchers and created a lot of confusions. What do you feel, how do you feel we as data librarians can best inform ourselves to prepare for this uh, and, uh, and grapple with this to help our users best make use of what I consider to be a fairly possibly bad situation? And I'll let each of you three briefly give give a whole thesis in like a few seconds. <laughs> um, I think it, it's going to be important for data librarians to just familiarize themselves at least with the final, whatever algorithm the Bureau uses to create the final products, to, to, to do some background into that, and to get a sense of what the overall magnitude of the noise could look like. And I think that gets at uh, Jeremy's question here, you're going to notice it most in the trend analysis. So how did things change from 2010 to 2020? If you've got some noise going on and just making sure that like, you know, that, that, that familiarization is just going to become really important because people might say, I'm seeing this weird spike in something. You as librarians can explain to them, oh, there's a new algorithm that's come up. Here's what's going on and explaining the implications. And I'm gonna be evil and say, we're gonna to have to end it like that because it's 1201. And I want to respect people's ability to go to the next session. But again, my thanks to our three panelists and good luck everybody over the next one or two years. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Ron. Thank you all.